Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the JavaScript Q&A sessions. Um, my name is Martin Schmidt. I am a developer advocate for Google Search uh, Central uh, or Google Search Relations. I am based out of Zurich and um, I'm running these on a fortnightly, which is to say 14 days frequency uh, basis. And um, if you are here, you might have seen that on our community tab of the YouTube channel, we post uh, these threads where you can ask us questions um, or you just happen to join the video. If you post comments on the video, that's great, but don't post questions there because I won't necessarily see them. I just disconnected one of the two lights that are shining upon me. So that was good job, well done. These are live and I don't really cut the recordings either. So there's that, uh, it's great, isn't it? I'm really, really excited to see that we have lots of questions. However, I noticed that a bunch of the questions that were submitted are not necessarily JavaScript specific questions. I might skip these in the future. I might address some of them anyway. Um, but if you have non JavaScript SEO questions, feel free to post them into the general JavaScript Q&A with John, um, who's also on my team. But yeah, without further ado, I'll go through the questions on YouTube and then I'll open the floor to live questions from my fantastic audience today. Lai Dui Bin is asking, uh, does it affect my website if there are more than other, like more than 300 other websites just who are just copying everything, uh, including images and stuff? Um, they just changed the domain and copied everything from the website. That's not really a JavaScript question, but uh, yes, it does affect uh, your content, especially if you don't think that's the canonical source of it, like the original source. Um, we are not like lawyers or anything, so you would have to take legal action. Uh, you can learn more about that if you look for DMCA, which is a mechanism to deal with exactly that kind of situation. Ankur asked a question that is JavaScript related. Uh, Hi, Martin, in case of dynamic rendering or a server-side rendered version, which Googlebot crawls, and you, you recently clarified the function wise, it does not have to be similar to the front end or like have add to card and stuff, but in terms of design and content, does it have to be exactly the same as front end? Um, no, no, it doesn't have to be the same. I just think it makes it a lot easier to have one code base that don't do what you're supposing to do or suggesting to do because it makes your, um, your surface area a lot larger and means that you have to test more stuff and that there's more chance of things going wrong and you're not noticing because it only happens in the crowd version. So if you can avoid that, I would avoid that. Um, but it can definitely be slightly different when it comes to like JavaScript elements for interactions and stuff like that. So it doesn't doesn't matter that much. Uh, Cosmos asks if JavaScript SEO isn't very useful. It is quite useful if you are, you know, using JavaScript heavily. You might have very JavaScript specific questions, such as the question that we just got from Angkor. Um, very strange crawl behavior, not really JavaScript specific, but let's, let's dive into it. So Timo is asking, we can observe more crawls in Search Console that successfully crawl the HTML pages, but do not load individual files like JavaScript, CSS images, and fonts. The error for 30 out of 80 resources could not be loaded. The description is other error. I'm guessing that's very likely in the live test, um, or it might also be in the crawl page when we actually crawl. Not a big deal because we are caching resources like CSS images and JavaScript files quite heavily. So normally that isn't really an issue. In the server logs of Cloudflare, we see that the Google crawler terminates the connection before the files were successfully downloaded. Yeah, that's because we are caching them. And if, if they don't come out quite quickly, then we don't really have to wait for them. Um, so even if the download time is only 300 milliseconds on average, um, we probably cancel it because we are just taking them from the cache. So that's not something that you necessarily need to worry about. Um, it's just something that happens. And uh, unless you have any specific issue, then I wouldn't worry about it. Resma is asking a question as well. Uh, we keep getting no index coverage issues on GSC for pages that have no such tags. Our developers from various departments have double and triple checked for any hidden no index tags. What could we do to rectify the problem? Um, I actually, it's, it's quite nice. Uh, she asked this question on Twitter before and uh, also sent me two URLs. One URL happens to be indexed. The other URL I'm still investigating. Um, normally, when this stuff happens, what happens is that there is some sort of A-B testing uh, framework or something that actually injects a no index in some variations in some cases when Googlebot crawls it. 
So for instance, there was one person who still had like an experimental setup, no experiments running, but then for like 20% of the requests that Googlebot made, we got a no index and the 80% was the other version that doesn't have a no index that is bound to cause trouble. Um, so it could be that, and I've seen that on this page, there's also some testing framework running um, that might be injecting this, but I haven't seen a no index yet. And I have to say that I haven't seen a no index yet either in the code. Um, in this specific case, it might be something else. Uh, I'll look into this and post back on Twitter. Um, but in, in general, if we say there's a no index, it's very likely that Googlebot just actually saw a no index. And if you can't reproduce that, that's uh, that's probably somewhere in your stack where you don't expect it. A-B testing frameworks being a big one. CDN sometimes do this as well. Um, but I'm looking into this specific case uh, because I'm not exactly sure what's happening there yet. Then there is a question related with uh, e-commerce SEO, also not really a JavaScript question. Um, so they, they basically just have a URL, um, xyz.com slash battlefield. And then eventually you have to change this URL uh, and then you have to have a different URL where this, this game actually comes up. That leads to a 404 page. How does this affect SEO? Well, if it's a 404 page, then it won't show up in search engines. That's not a problem. That's not something that you need to deal with. If you want to forward signals from the old version of that URL to the new version of the URL and the content is pretty much the same, then you can use a redirect. If it's different pages uh, and the old page just went down, just have it a 404 page. That's not a problem. Things be removed all the time. Like That's what happens. It's OK. No worries. No worries there. Anas is asking a question as well. Uh, it is a JavaScript-related question, indeed. I've seen on numerous occasions that the uh, PageSpeed Insights recommends to reduce unused JavaScript for external JavaScript, like Facebook, Google Tag Manager, and Google Analytics, which reduces our LCP considerably, so largest content for pain considerably. Is there any way to work out those external JavaScript, since I don't see how we can modify our work on JavaScript that are not hosted on our domain? Thanks in advance. Yes, um, that's a tricky one. That's generally you have to always do a very careful or take a very careful look at your third party dependencies um, because they probably carry a lot of functionality that you're not using. In a previous company where I worked at um, and where this was important for us, for instance, for analytics, we used the analytics API. So we actually did not really load JavaScript uh, for, for Google Analytics directly. We basically just sent events. Um, using our own little bit of JavaScript so that we could control the amount of data, um, or sorry, the amount of JavaScript that we needed to actually ping events back to analytics. Um, that comes with pros and cons. The pro is, yes, we have reduced the JavaScript size. The con is if the API changes or if we are using it incorrectly, then we might lose analytics data. So that's a, that's a little bit tricky, um, but in, in general, do due diligence on your third-party scripts. If it's something that you absolutely need, then just you have to swallow the pill of them carrying around a little bit of luggage. Um, if you don't really need them, then reconsider if you have alternatives that you could use instead um, that might be smaller or work with the APIs directly if their client library is running very big. Um, then, we are having Kashi asking, uh, what is the recommended time to first byte or initial rendering recommended for crawling a page by Google crawlers? There's no such recommendation. It doesn't matter. We have noticed that the public Facebook pages are getting indexed to Google, but not 100% of them. Um, we suspect the response time of our web pages is on the higher side. Uh, I think in general, reducing your time to first byte is good for your users. So as fast as you can make your website is good. Um, I would say for time to first byte, probably sub-second uh, is what you're, you should be aiming for. Maybe like a second is a good general thing. But it's, again, not specific for Google crawlers. That's just specifically not making people wait for your content. Um, if it's not indexing, it could also just be that we are not super interested in some of the pages, or some of the pages have quality issues, or we're not seeing the content properly. So we won't always index all the pages of your website. Um, that's a normal fact of life, and not necessarily something re related to um, website speed. Andre is asking uh, about A-B testing as well. We may run 
AB or ABCD, so multivariate testing on homepage and other pages on our site. And some of these AB tests involve very significant changes of content. Um, and they are now worried that uh, we might consider that cloaking. I don't think that's the case unless your content is horrendously different as in like from topically completely different and, and separate from each other. I don't think this will be a cloaking issue. So I would not worry about A-B testing too much if it's just changing the design and changing the content a little bit. Um, but the page, let's say like a page about toasters continues to be about toasters, you should be fine. Image Googlebot crawl my site more often than smartphone Googlebot. Should I worry about this? No. So, and again, not a JavaScript specific question. Is there any specific name for getting links from pages that are not often already have links? Uh, someone suggested internal linking, and I'd say plus one to that. Um, yeah, then the question uh, Udi is asking, or Udi, I'm sorry if I butcher your name. Uh, does Google in uh, Googlebot index hash URL content? Does Googlebot index content wrapped in tabs like reviews and QA tabs? Hash your all content, as in, if I change the hash, the content completely changes and loads different content. No, that usually does not work. But if the content is in the HTML and just not shown, and if the, the hash changes, the different content is shown, then that should generally work. Um, that's the case with tabs and, and carousels and stuff like that, where or accordions, where different sections open and expand um, depending on what the hash is. But the content is all there. Um, that does not pose a problem. All right, those were the YouTube questions. I see that someone posted in the chat. Lee posted in the chat. Uh, if we're using pre-render at the cached page for Google, crawling has a wonky layout. Due to an error on the pre-rendering, would that impact our indexing for that page in particular? Nah, the index, uh, if it's just the, the layout, it doesn't matter too much. Um, also, the Google cache is not necessarily working properly all the time. Uh, with JavaScript websites, so I wouldn't worry about that too much either. Um, if you see any weird things going on, then that's worthwhile investigating further, but it just a weird preview doesn't really matter that much. All right, in that case, I open the floor for questions from the audience. Let's see if anyone raised their hands. No raised hands so far, but you can also just speak up if you want. We are a small group today. Okay, Martin, I have a question here. Yes. So recently I was helping a user that had a, an e-commerce. And when we look at that, the mobile friendly test for uh, the problem that they were having is that um, our pages are being considered canonical. So mm -hmm. it looked like a canonical page, but when we were going to look at the mobile friendly test, all we could see was the boiler plate, right? So we could see mm -hmm. like the menu and things. So for Googlebot, it looked at, like the same page and the product data itself were, was not loading. So I suspect it was some, I don't know, some JavaScript resource that was not being loaded. Do you see this often? How would you go by uh, troubleshooting this if you were the website owner? Where to look first? And it will disappear in yeah. uh, friendly test somehow, I don't know. Yeah. So. That does sound a lot like clients like JavaScript not doing its thing properly. And uh, the very first thing that I would do is I would look in the rendered HTML and make sure that the content really is not present. If it's not present, I would try to find out. I would go into my developer tools in the browser and basically start blocking URLs that look like they're loading the content. Um, and then basically try to figure out which API call is actually responsible for loading the content that is now missing. and then check with um with google search console if these are actually if these properly failed don't necessarily do the live test because the live test is very very impatient with these things so you might actually get other error there when there is not actually a problem with it um so you sometimes see false positive but basically i would try to figure out and hunt down why these network requests haven't been successfully done and haven't successfully loaded the content in. Sometimes in the Search Console, uh, if you look at view crawl page, you also see um, console messages and error messages that might give you a clue of what's happening there. Um, you can also use the resources page to see why something hasn't been loaded. And 
then you should already see more bits and pieces that might help you. It could be something as simple as uh, a developer or someone blocking it in robots takes you like, oh, we don't want the API requests to be done by robots, which is unfortunate because in rendering exactly that happens. And then if we can't, then we can't see the content. It can be that the API is too slow. It can be that there is a backend problem that it doesn't always load. It could be that there's something in front of your API that blocks robots. There's a bunch of different things that can go wrong in these situations. Um, and you would have to then basically go step by step from is it in the HTML? When, if it's not in the HTML, did we even try to make the network request? If we made the network request, why did it fail? And then if it failed, is this something that is on Google's side? Is this something that is on our side? Very likely it's something in between your backend and us. And that can be like a CDN, that can be like a, a DDoS protection layer. There's many, many different things that can get in, in the way of that. Um, but yeah, I would start looking in the rendered HTML and then in the JavaScript console and then in the network layer, and then basically work my way through to find out what's causing these requests to fail. Yeah, looking into the DevTools calls, it's a good idea. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Andre has raised his hand. Muted. Feel free to unmute muted. yourself. Uh, ah, muted, there sorry. We go. No uh, yeah, uh, I was the one asking questions about A, B, C, D tests mm -hmm. you answered. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Mike, an, another question that I have is about how to go about improving the FID metrics on Core of Vitals, because basically mm -hmm. uh, with the rest like CLS or LCP metrics, you know, it's it's a bit more straightforward. You sort of look at the lab, lab data and uh, you understand what what is more or less need, needs to be fixed. But mm. with the FID, I'm sort of a bit stuck here because uh, on uh, when I look at the good Google Search Console, uh, most of the pages that I have, uh, they're like like thousands and thousands, mm. you know. Um, they uh, like, but I just took a very good, like maybe about 100, 100 or even a couple of hundred pages sample. And all of them are showing low uh, FID score, like maybe less than um, less than 100, you know. But at the same time, when I um, uh, Google is reporting the that this metrics is not acceptable, you know, mm -hmm. so and uh, I was trying to like go through the time to force byte approach uh, uh, and uh, maybe see what uh, would be the uh things to improve there but at the same time it's not really clear and maybe mm. you can have some tips like mm. how to troubleshoot that and uh, where to look for yeah um fid is indeed a tricky one the first input delay is usually something that's really hard to measure properly in uh in lab data it's more easily seen in, in um, real user metrics um in general FID blockage, I, if it's under 100 milliseconds, it should actually be fine. It should be considered passing. If yeah, it is not... lower, it's weird. That's weird. Uh, if it is lower than 100 milliseconds, that is under the threshold. So I'm not sure why I would complain about that then. I mean, hold on. Google Search Console reports the metric to be higher than 100 milliseconds. And when you measure it's lower than 100 milliseconds, is that what's happening? Yeah, yeah. Like, for example, I'm taking, uh, like, we have about 80,000 pages uh, reporting right. that FID is not passing the, the Corvo Vitals uh, threshold. Right. So uh, I took, a, like, sizable sample uh, of these pages, and all of them are showing, let's say, 0. Point, like 50 milliseconds, 70 milliseconds, but all of them are showing lower lower metrics on page PageSpeed Insights. So I, I sort of even don't know like how to start. Um, uh, you that, broke up there in uh, the end, like but I, th I think. Uh, what's ah. This yeah. oh. ah, OK, you came back now. I'm, I'm not sure if it's my internet connection. Uh, how to start improving on this so i think very important to notice is again um, fid mostly comes from from real user metrics and it's really really hard to replicate in lab data i have a feeling that what might happen is that you have a bunch of users on devices that are a little more limited than the devices that you are using so i noticed that when i was looking at websites um, that were 
mostly used by people on lower end mobile devices, these are a lot more sensitive to FID issues than let's say like pretty much uh, the, the laptop I'm working on, for instance, or the, the we, from Google, we get the Pixel phones. Um, the Pixel phones are relatively smooth as well. The latest iPhones are probably also fast, but then older generations, especially older Android generations of lower power specifications are definitely struggling with this. And then it's worthwhile to sample to basically get a performance profile of the website and have a look at what is going on in the mainframe. And depending on what your website does, this can be all sorts of different things. This can be some sort of template instantiation. This can be um, when DOM uh, uh, manipulations are being done by the JavaScript. Anything that blocks the main, uh, main thread, not the mainframe, the main thread is usually also what, if it takes longer, is causing FID issues. So taking a performance profile in the dev tools and having a look at what is going on in the main, main thread of your website is actually a good first point of contact or first point of call. And if you see, let's say, I don't know, uh, it might be something that actually causes, uh, like some DOM manipulation causes massive layout recalculations. And that also is, it doesn't necessarily have to be the JavaScript. It can also be like a tiny spike of JavaScript and then a massive block of layout recalculations and then paint. Paint doesn't matter. Paint doesn't happen on, main, uh, on the main thread, but layout does. So whenever you're doing something that is heavy lifting on the, let's actually, hold on. Let me see if I can find an example because I think I have a, ah, uh, why is my laptop getting so slow? Ah. Uh, um, Ah, shit. I can't remember that. Hold on. I'll find the website real quick, and then um, I'll show you what I mean by that. Actually, I don't really have an example for that specific thing, but I do have an example for, for a similar problem. OK, so that's what it's called. So I need to go to github.io slash. And then I think, no, it doesn't. What? What do you mean it doesn't have? the uh, thing. Um, OK, let's try that again, slash main thread. I think that's, that's probably leading to success here. And it does not. GitHub goes like, no, nah, I don't know what you're talking about, which is great. But I do have this posted somewhere. OK, hold on. Let's try that again, because I think I'm on the wrong JavaScript. In parallel, where is it? Because I know I have that somewhere. So the, the point is that the with websites, the biggest issue really is that um, that your your entire JavaScript runs on the main thread, and that's where all the interactions work with or ex happen as well. Which ah here it is. Ah ha ha ha! I, I named it differently. Um, and I'll share my screen real quick. Hold on. Screen my, I want to share a tab. And now, so there is a website that the whole purpose of this website is to load an image and do edge detection on it. And that looks fancy and fine and nice and lovely. But the moment I move this, you see, like I try to drag it up here, it doesn't even let me. It takes seconds for it to respond. I drag it down here and 1, 21, 20, yeah. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5. Roughly five seconds it takes until the website actually allows me to interact with it again. And um, if this were a real world website, which I really, 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 really hope it is not, uh, I mean, this is a test website for sure. Then we can see this behavior by, um, actually, I don't want to see the news down here. I actually want to see, we can reload the page and try to see what happens here. So it's loading. And then round, like roughly after five seconds, it actually did show the thing, but it continued running. And here we see, like, you see this, this 
I actually, hold on. Do you actually see what happens in the DevTools? No, you don't, because I only shared that. Ah, oh, damn it. Hold on. Uh, let me actually share the whole window, because you can't actually see the DevTools if I'm sharing a tab. Good job, Martin. Well done. Um, smart, smart guy here. Not. So let's run that again. So we are reloading the page. We are reprofiling the page. After roughly three seconds, the, the image popped in. And after roughly eight seconds, uh, we get the website. And now you see like this huge bar of red up here. And that means that the website has been laggy. In this specific case, it meant it didn't take any input. And it didn't take input from, I would say, this is around one second to roughly three seconds. So for two seconds, this would be a first input delay situation. And I think, so that's first contentful paint was also delayed by this. Um, and I don't see any events for, for the other bits and pieces, but whatever. Uh, and we see here that it's all JavaScript. So we painted this green blob here. That's painting the picture. That doesn't matter because that happens on the graphics card. But then there's like a lot of JavaScript going on back here. And this JavaScript is exactly what is causing the problem. So if we are dragging this up a little bit, we see there's a load event. There's a first contentful paint event, and all of that happens very, very late in the process. Uh, and it didn't even notice that there was a first input delay issue, but this website definitely has a first input delay issue. And it also warns us here, it says long task to 2.2 seconds. Um, and then we can see why this is happening by digging in a little deeper. And if you scroll up a little bit, and we say, like, OK, so lots of JavaScript has actually happened. And then we can see the call tree where we see there's a function being called. There's a bunch of stuff happening. But what function is called, we actually don't have instrumentation on this one, so we really don't know necessarily. But the function call seems to have taken most of the time, because in half a second, we actually decoded the image. So using the performance profiler down here is actually really, really helpful to figure out where the, your website gets stuck. Someone posted in the chat, I do hope. Uh, I can share the URL with you. There's also, I, I wonder if I actually have a starting page that has links to the other. Yes, it does. Um, so I can share this link with you. Um, it shows different approaches to this. Uh, for instance, there is one that uses a web worker to solve this problem. And then there's one that uses a uh, web chair because it specifically is a graphics issue. So now here, you see like it's not perfect, but at least I can continuously interact with the page. Even though the work still takes three seconds, like one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. So like it, it still takes time for the work to be carried out because it's still JavaScript doing the work on the CPU and it's really, really not meant for that. But at least my website doesn't stop inter interacting. And if you can't measure that in lab settings or with your own devices, that is not surprising because we all have really good devices. But if your users are on slower devices, then they are struggling with this. Here, by the way, is the same example uh, in WebGL where we can pretty much smoothly navigate through the threshold. It makes it a little slower because it needs to interact with the WebGL context. But the lag is minimal, and there's no initial delay. If we were to profile this page, one, one, four, five, six, seven, we still get a little bit of blockage, but that's mostly because I'm doing stupid things and the, the painting is quite large, but then the JavaScript, I do a bunch of JavaScript to deal with the uh, WebGL and I do that inefficiently, but the tasks are basically faster. So we dropped one frame here. So yeah, for first input delay is not easy to debug, and I'm very well aware of that. Um, but try to figure out what kind of devices your users are using, and Google Analytics or other analytics solutions could potentially help you with that. Um, and then try to figure out how your website behaves on these devices. And I have a hunch that the devices will be slightly older and probably mobile devices. and um, 
it's not going to be easy to to debug these things um but it can yeah. help you get a better idea of what's uh, happening i i think i actually understood uh, the essence of and uh, thank you very much for explaining that so we do have a lot of visitors from africa and mm, from yeah. a lot of uh, countries that with, with a very slow connection we've noticed that before then especially for the pages uh, that are targeting these regions or targeting the u.s regions which is also including the african mm -hmm. countries uh, that uh, the metrics of core vitals are going down quite a bit mm -hmm. so i think uh, yeah really after after this uh, uh, thing i will try to dig into the data more closely to, to sort of see if this yeah. is the the root cause of this problem yeah and then try and then try to figure out what is even if it's very short on your devices you could still properly see what's happening on the main thread and what might be the culprit that takes a long time if you can get your hands on a device that your users are actually using like try to find out the number one device that the users who are experiencing the problems are using and you can actually use that in in a real world scenario and debug on that and you can use remote debugging uh, to actually get this like performance timeline, then you see exactly what is taking so long to actually push you over the 100 milliseconds. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you very much for this. You're very uh, much welcome. Also, I very much appreciate Kyle's uh, background uh, and the fact that your cat is is popping by. I'm I'm really enjoying pets on on the office yeah. hours. Yeah, she is a little bit upset that I'm talking to you and not to her. So not enough attention. I understand. Yeah, not that. enough attention. Exactly. <laughs> I understand that. Cool. Any other questions? Always worried when Giacomo is here because he usually has questions where I don't know the answer to, which is which is great. No, 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 no hard question today. I just uh, want to ask you an update on the on the list of the most common JavaScript error. If you had time or not? Damn, I did not have time. I no, no way I could get there, but. Uh, I, I sit on the data, I just need to crunch it, and I, I don't think this is going to happen anytime soon, to be honest. But I'm trying. I'll I'll keep it in mind. Actually, I'm meeting with Andre on Thursday, which, oh my god, is tomorrow. So I can probably like ask him very nicely, and he'll very nicely say no, because I asked him before. But I'll try to ask him again. Maybe. Maybe he has some time. Cool. Excellent. If there are no other questions, I'd like to thank you all for joining in live. Uh, and everyone who watches the video, thanks again for your time. Uh, everyone who submitted questions, thanks even more for your time to submit questions. And um, yeah, I wish you all a wonderful day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, see you in two weeks. Have a good time. Bye-bye. See you, Martin. Bye.